thank you, O oh God, that the authority and the rule and reign of Jesus is upon our lives. And we thank you, O oh God, and we are excited in our spirit because of what you have done and what you are going to do. We thank you, O oh God, that we are the generation that will see the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, Father, we know that time is short. And we know, Lord, that even now your Holy Spirit works in the advance of this world, bringing nations, O oh Lord, to the last day scenario in which you are organizing, Lord, to display the power of your glory. And we ask, O oh God, that even as you move in our hearts and in our lives, even as we find our destiny in you, Oh, Father God, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come upon our lives this day, afresh upon us, O oh God, that we may find for each one of us our very destiny in you. Our reason why we exist, O oh God, the reason why we are born, the reason why we are here on this planet Earth, and the reason why we are here as a part of the body of Christ. We ask, O oh God, that you will quicken in our hearts and our lives the word that we need to hear, the word of your power. Thank you, O oh God. We are in your perfect will, O oh God, and what a joy it is to perform and to do the perfect will of God. And it is our desire, Lord, that every single individual here would line up with your perfect will. Father, we take authority over Satan in Jesus' name. And all he was works, Lord, to to any form or individual organization that will stop us from doing your will. Father, we take authority over every wicked spirit in the high places, over every ruler of the darkness of this age, over every principality and power. In Jesus' name, we command all of them to decease in their many ways against any one of our lives here in this place. Is anyone, O oh Lord, who has become a part of this church, against our ministries, O oh God, and every aspect of the church, in everything that we set our hand on to, Lord, Lord, we declare that your angels, O oh God, go before us and are with us, O oh Lord. And we thank you, O oh God, that our enemies are scattered seven ways. We thank you, Father God, and we proclaim the rule and the reign of Jesus, that the kingdom of God is here, Lord. In this place. Thank you, Father God. And we command every bondage should be broken. We take authority over every sickness. And we take authority over every weapon and every tongue that rises against you. In Jesus' name they shall be judged, O Lord. We thank you, O God, that nothing can stand against your perfect will. We thank you, O Lord, and we release the flow of your blessings upon your people. We thank you, O God. For your grace and your mercy, let your power flow even here and cause us to experience your love, your presence, even afresh this morning. We love you, O oh God, with all our hearts and all our minds. We love you with all our strength and all that is within us. And we ask, O oh God, that once again you glorify Jesus in our midst. Hallelujah. Live him high in our midst, O oh God, that we may fall in love with Jesus more and more and over and over again. We declare your presence, O oh Lord. We declare your wisdom. Thank you, Father God, for your grace and your mercy and your direction that you place upon each one of our lives. We seal it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. <coughs> We will continue the series that we've been touching on, on the mega church principles. And we have come right up to principle number seven. And uh, just to revise what we touched uh, last week, principle number six was uh, speaking about uh, priority classifications and uh, principle number eight was constant slimming program. Uh, principle number seven there is constant slimming program. We have shown how that in any big organization that uh, it's easy to put on weight. It's just like when you reach a certain age, 
we have to be more careful about our diet and more disciplined about our lifestyle because they tend to put on weight easily and in the same way a mega church puts on weight easily all you have to do is every de department do a little bit of excess and you end up as a whole, whole uh, overweight and bureaucracy coming in and so it always needs not just one but a constant slimming program this morning we'll touch on two more principles principle number eight principle number eight harmony or slow and fast harmony or slow and fast that's principle number eight and in looking at harmony or slow and fast we have mentioned in one of our earlier principles that uh, I believe it's principle number two that there is a greater and longer time frame for change. Now what we were talking of in principle number two is in reference to the time frame of change that we have to be prepared it takes a longer time to change more people. However, on the action part and on the preparation for the action and on the leadership part there is a harmony between slow and fast. Now by a long time frame of change, that doesn't mean that's how we live. It doesn't mean that we only go slow motion all the time. It doesn't mean that. You could go at, on a fifth gear and still the time, the time frame for change is a longer period for a mega church. By time frame of change, I don't mean that we travel only on first gear on a federal highway. Time frame for change means that you could engage your fifth gear, the fastest gear that you can, and still the time frame for change needs to be even a longer period for a mega church. The bigger the place, you have to give a bigger time frame. And that's where principle number eight comes in to tell us that it doesn't mean that you engage first gear all the time. You have to have the capability to move from first, second, third, fourth, and fifth gear in your decision making and your leadership capabilities. However, when we do so, there is a harmony between the slow and the fast. Let me describe it. We need, because it's a mega church and a mega organization, needs a greater, greater preparation, a greater counting of the cost, a greater weighing of consequences and results before the action is done. Now that part needs the most thorough and uh, ample time needs to be given for that thoroughness to come forth. Slow and fast. Thorough and quick. Which means that before an action is taken, that a person must weigh the consequences and all possibilities. For example, a person who is not able to evaluate the possibilities or consequences will not be able to be in, in mega church leadership. Well, let me give another example. If you are inviting about five people to a love feast in your house, there are five possible ways in which there can be a delay depending on what happens to these five people. Now, if all of them comes together in one transport system and in one van and somebody picks all of them up, then the, the possibility for the delay can be reduced to two or three. But when you invite 50 people and they are more out, uh, widespread, it is different. Your possibility of delay are greater and uh, statistical wise there is a greater possibility that that some new thing will happen that may not involve the first five in an organization the bigger an organization the more choices of complication and possible response comes that you never have in a smaller group. 
Therefore, any leader in a mega church organization must have the ability to see very thoroughly all possibilities. For example, it is not it is not right. For example, let's say if something happens uh, in a toilet and somebody uses the toilet and throws it about, you don't come to the church announcement time and announce where three people out of three thousand people have misused the toilet. You don't come up to the pulpit to announce to the other 2,997 people that the toilet is being abused. Can you see the consequences? Now, people who are small in their thinking only see like a, like for example, a small little home and housewife. Oh, this toilet problem. Oh, yes. Yeah, if, it, if the toilet problem in your family, where your family is not keeping the toilet clean, you could just call four or five members of your family together and say, look here. Everyone has to do our part to keep the home clean. You could just do that. But in a mega church, you can't do that. You can't take the time of 90% of the people, 95% of the people to, to, to correct the problem of 5% of the people. You only take the time of 95% of the people if the problem is within the 95% of the people. Now what happens to someone who doesn't have a mega church? personality to conduct that, they, they will be doing that. And what happens? It creates more problems. The solution to that one tiny problem which affects three people out of three thousand creates a greater problem. It creates discouragement, disgust, and uh, people who are turned off. It creates tongue backbiting, tongue, tongue uh, spreading, and wrong thing. And the solution of one problem creates four other problems. And that is why some things that you do in a small organization, you could do it in a certain style. But when an organization grows, the access to the public system, whether to written form or verbal form or oral form, becomes more limited and we must be more careful how we use it. So we don't use the pulpit, we don't use the printed page, to address a problem that is only related to 3 to 5% of people. We handle it by calling the 3 to 5% people and meeting with them. That's the way we handle it. And so the others could live and rejoice and be blessed without even being aware that the problem was being corrected. It's important to understand how thorough we must be before we act. Therefore, therefore, we need to take the maximum time we can before the action comes. Which is where there must be a slow part. You need to slowly gather all the facts and data. There is a greater chance that there is a um, miscommunication and misinformation of data. When you have 3,000 people, it's easy that what you hear to the third or fourth person may be slightly exaggerated or may be out of context. And we cannot afford to be leaders who just are too quick, too fast, who doesn't think and meditate and count the cause before he acts. And every time you hear something, you act. You hear something, you act. You hear something, you act. Look, there are 3,000 people. You'll be acting all the time in the wrong thing. Could do that in a small group. But in a big group, you must weigh the consequences of every action. Let's take running a government. You cannot, the government cannot just decide and say, and overnight say, um, I think I'll just increase the tax for uh, those income group here and here. <coughs> I think they can do that. They can't. They have to study. They have to evaluate what will happen to this group. Will it affect the poor? 
We had a group that were really affected. That is why it takes a longer time for governmental programs to be, to be acted upon because they are still looking at the consequences. And what happens to, for example, if you are in charge of a huge big uh, engineering uh, pro- program or building project, and uh, maybe you're building a building that is 200 stories high. You cannot just decide overnight and say, well, I think uh, this is a good idea. Boom! And you make a decision without considering all the other things down the line that will take place because of your one decision. Because the bigger you are, the further your decision goes. The bigger the rock that is thrown into the water, the bigger the ripple. The small little pebble cause a small ripple. The, the bigger the pebble, the bigger the rock, the bigger the ripple. It could cause a little, little tidal wave. <laughs> it's important for us to wave. And some things look obvious, but they are not. Let me give you something. Pastor Joshua, can you bring three chairs here? Thank you. One, two, three, just three chairs. I know. Uh, <coughs> Let me illustrate. We've, uh, thank you. I'm going to put the chairs this way. And uh, pretend these chairs are, thank you, three little pillars. These chairs are three little pillars. Oh no, I wouldn't touch that. I know. Wow, well, well. If I can touch this little microphone stand. This. Here we go. And uh, let's assume that this, let's say you're an engineer and this is a pillar and this is a pillar. Normally, let's say that you rest your column between those two pillars. And you're thinking, well, those two pillars, they are safe. Fantastic. I mean, the weight is being taken by these two pillars and uh, that's the situation. Now, I have read out also in engineering, I realized that if it's a curve here, the stress goes to the side and there's no sort of stress in the middle. But when there's something flat here and uh, the two pillars there and it's like a, uh, uh, it's like a square box, there is some stress that is here pushing down and there's stress that is here pushing down. So there's a stress where the center of gravity is. If it's curved, you don't have a center of gravity stress there, it's pushed to the side. Uh, as you look at, suppose you're an engineer and you're building a building with lots of pillars. Let's say in one section there are, more, in, in some sections, it's two pillars holding the weight of one foundational pillar. Then you have a bright idea, or a so-called bright idea. If two pillars can take the weight, three can take a greater weight. Logical. Without considering all the little, little things that will be involved. You make a decision to add another pillar. Now this incident actually happened, I think uh, it's somewhere either in England or Europe or somewhere, and they actually did that when they were renovating a building. They added an additional pillar. And they changed the plan of the original designer. So they add another pillar. So you have it. The other pillar is here. Okay. So the other pillar is here. And it's in the center. The other pillar is in the center. And now, hello there. Let's turn it this way. There we go. Now, logically you say two, uh, three is better than two. Three heads are better than two, two heads are better than one. <laughs> That's in your mind. But do you know that there's a new problem that you just created? Can anybody figure out what a new problem is? It's an engineering and mathematical problem. It couldn't be out. Why, 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 why should it be a problem? Three pillars are better than two. But do you realize by doing that you created a new problem? The whole mathematics has changed. The whole engineering skill and engineering parts that take the stress force have changed. You have actually changed a foundational principle. 
But to the man on the street, huh? put another pillar there. The more pillars are stronger. Uh, uh. When you're building a building, it's not the more the merrier. If your foundation is not strong, you put the more the merrier, the whole thing collapsed. Just like it happened in Thailand, I think last year. Oh, they add one more story. It's okay. Add two more stories. It's okay. Add one more story. That was it. Whole building collapsed. Because our actions by increasing the size of a building, our actions by increasing the size of a mega church, our actions by creating a sizable uh, movement within a mega church, our large organization creates new problems that were not in existence when it was small. Have you thought what the problem is yet? Let me give you the answer. Maybe I should not give you an answer, give you homework. <laughs> Let me tell you where the problem is. This only works. Three pillars instead of two only works. If all the three pillars are exactly the same height. And over the next three to five years, they remain the same height. Thank you for the illustration. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> But this is a good illustration. You can see that if it was two, it wouldn't have fallen anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and it only works if over the next three to five years or forever throughout the life of that building, that the soil under each pillar sinks the same amount. If at any point... The soil or the length of the pillar is not the same. That means pillar number one, pillar number two, and pillar number three are unequal. If pillar number two, which is in the center, is unequal, and let's say pillar number two sinks, it's still not too bad because you have a certain hole of the two, presuming that this is a straight line. But and uh, of course, if pillar number three sinks, if the center of gravity here is too great, the stress force here is too great, and the line is too long that this stress force is too great, it will break in two in the middle. Now what happens here is what happens if pillar number three disappears or it sinks lower than the others. And you can't see it. These are all microscopic sinking. And it sinks. Okay, let me illustrate by putting the whole chair down. It sinks. You can't see. It's not visible to the eye, but the stress force has already started. What happens is that you actually, what you actually end up with is the column resting on two pillars with one side of the column jutted out. Can you see that? Although you see three pillars, but because the three pillars don't sink equally or they're in equal in length, and if the last pillar at the side sinks lower than the other two, although you see the three pillars there, the weight is being taken by only two pillars. It is actually only a long, long column resting on two pillars with one long side jutted up. Now what happens if above this column is a few floors? What you have is a building standing on one leg. You have created a, a building standing on one leg, in a sense. And what happens when the force and the pressure of the building is coming down so greatly and is gr as great here as as great there and this pillar doesn't have the strength to take that, that pressure, the gravitational force. This pillar will break at this place here. This place will be broken. And that was what exactly happened last year to a building, I think it's in England or somewhere. They changed the engineering plan by adding an extra pillar. 
And they actually have changed the whole building. The original architect and engineer planned for the pillars to rest nicely on the weight of two. At the edge, the pressure goes to the side. And the, and the column size was not such that it could take the weight uh, at the edge. The edge. And so what happened in... Thank you, Pastor Joshua, you can keep this. Now what happened is, simplistic thinking, now we can be simple in heart, simple in our lifestyle, but simplistic thinking, like you build your kampong house, you put extra pillars because the thing is all made of wood, under normal circumstances it should be stronger. Then you're playing around with reinforced concrete and a lot of bigger size buildings. When the building is huge, these small little things make a lot of difference. Things that never create problems begin to create problems. And I illustrate with that engineering uh, problem to show forth that when you're in a mega organization or, or, or big organization, wherever you work with, and you're in, a, in leadership or in whatever role you are in, that what you see or you think to be the immediate solution, you must learn how to be disciplined not to act yet. You must look into new possibilities. Can this thing create a new problem? We have to have the ability to weigh new problems, new consequences that resolve. We have to have the discipline of being slow the discipline of taking the time to evaluate all consequences. If you don't have the discipline to hold back yourself from simply acting without thinking, it's very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. You could act and create a new problem, like the engineering problem I just introduced to you, without realizing it. The building will crash, people will be injured, and people may die. When you're in a big organization, we have to be careful about making decisions. Yes, the word is careful. Because you can make a new decision that will end up causing suffering to one sector in the organization that you were not aware of. Therefore, the bigger the organization, the greater the discipline must be to take all the maximum time you can to study the matter. Now, as a big organization, you've got to study the matter, weigh the consequences before you take action. It's not just simply doing and putting into, into action every thought that comes to you. There is a consideration of its impact and the result that is even more necessary. That was never there before when it's small. Now, in a small little building, it's made of wood, small little, you know, attap house, and, and the more pillars you, you add, generally it's fine. But not when you're in a mega building, where every pillar counts, and every new pillar doesn't, may not be helping, it may create a new problem. It's different when things are big. Because now the length of the, co of the column, or the length of the column that, that is uh, horizontal, is wider, bigger. And it's subject to forces that it was never subjected to before. We need discipline to be slow, careful, and studious. Not every single idea must be evaluated, analyzed, and studied carefully. Now, I know that different problems is given a different time frame. For me, my personal set of analysis is, if the decision affects more people, the longer time I will take. Because I know it's consequences. We have to have the inner check. Why are dictators made? Dictators are people who take actions at their whims and fancies causing suffering without considering all the consequences of all the actions. You could give the same power and authority 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, who before he makes any command or makes any decision, he considers the weakest member. He considers how it will affect us. It's important for us to understand the discipline to be slow, steady, studious, etc. Now I realize that all problems have a time frame. You cannot be too slow or the problem will kill everyone. That is also dangerous. If the problem is such that it's going to kill everyone, you have only a limited time frame, but yet you got to you still got to evaluate before you take action. But your time frame of evaluation is, is, is on a lesser scale. So that we need to have a discipline to hold back, to be slow, to study carefully. Now, the opposite side. After the evaluation has been done, after the study has been done, after the analysis has been done, after you have exhausted the time frame given for you to study, the time for action has come. The opposite is true. You must be as fast as lightning. If you know what to do and how to act, you must not waste time. Every second counts. Because in a mega organization, once the action is taken and if it's too slow, and you know what is right and the action is too slow, you will have an effect of a reaction to the action coming. Understand what I mean? To every action, there is a reaction from the enemy. Do you understand? We ha- our enemy is Satan and demon. Satan cannot read the, our mind. He can only read the expressions on your face and in your life. So when he throws a dart at you of, de- of depression, and then he looks at your face, you go, oh. he, he hasn't read your mind yet. He knows that it's working. We must be quick and decisive once you have done your homework. No time to be lost so that Satan and carnal men cannot stop you. Because carnal people are people who are used by their enemies. And when you walk on this earth to do God's will, you realize that opposition is there from the enemy and from people who don't walk with God. You know God protects you from that. But you know that unless you take the proper action, when you know why the action is fast, you will give Satan time to recoup and react. You will give carnal people time to react and create too great an opposition to God's will. And you make your own task harder. Now for some Bible examples. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The details are given to us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Turn to the book of Galatians, just to read one sentence there. Galatians, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as son. Now here's the slowness part. God planned to send us a Savior from Genesis chapter 3 when He prophesied that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. It took nearly 4,000 years later. 
And God gave a little bit of revelation to those of His redeemed saints all through history. Bible says in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, the fullness of the time had come. Now obviously, God had it all planned. But do you realize there was no action for nearly 4,000 years? A lot of words but no action. A lot of prophecies but no action. A lot of preparation but no action. A lot of... uh, Strategic positioning, but no action. Because God was waiting for the fullness of time. And suddenly, when the fullness of time comes, God sent His angel, and within one year to two years, so many things happened that you never could have dreamed of. And in the next 33 years of Jesus' life, there were more prophecies fulfilled than in any other part of the Old Testament. How quick, when God works, He works. Some of the fast things that take place, the moment, the moment Jesus was born, everything was accelerated. From the time that it was announced to Mary, everything was accelerated. All the angels of Jera, but before there is all preparation. There is a harmony between the skill, skill to be slow. Why slow? In order to study, analyze, count the cause, weigh the consequences, and the result of the action and decision. But when that part is over, it's time to launch up all out for the action. In the Gospel of Matthew, the moment the birth of Jesus was announced in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1, Mary had the child and in verse 20 the angel was sent again to Joseph to tell him to take Mary as his wife and verse 24 Joseph arose and took Mary as wife then immediately there was a working in the heart of the Roman Caesar to declare the census and cause Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem where Jesus was to be born, to fulfill the prophecy. And then at the same time, in chapter 2, there were wise men from the east. Suddenly things were accelerated. They saw the star. By the time they reached Jesus, it was about two years later. And all through those times, there was a lot of activity in heaven and on earth. In verse 13, of course we know in the Gospel of Luke about the shepherd, how a host of angels came and announced to them the day Jesus was born. Matthew chapter 2 verse 13 Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. He has to act quickly. What happened if Joseph is too slow? He will die. The child will die. Why? Why the quickness? Because Satan was coming after Jesus. To have it. See, when, when we, we are in a mega organization, you've got to harmonize between the discipline to be slow and the, and the discipline to be fast. Slow means, you ha- if you haven't evaluated a situation yet, you must not act. You must have the discipline not to act. And you don't act just because somebody tells you. You don't act because the emotional pressure is great. You don't act because there's pressure from other, any other sources by God to act. You don't act because there's a rumor. You don't act because of all this. You act because you have weighed the consequences of your action. Hello there. And the work of weighing the consequences is a lot of work. A lot of work. What are some of those things? Start point one. Gathering of facts and data. That takes time. If all the facts and data is not in, and you have insufficient data, you make a wrong decision. Sub point two, it takes time to analyze the data. It takes time to gather the data. Gathering the data is a lot of work. Analyzing the data is another work. You read about a human genome project. Analysis of the human genetic DNA, RNA, DNA. What are they doing? What are the scientists doing? Do you know all they are doing is just gathering data and classifying them? It will take another 40, 50 years to analyze it. 
it, it, it's going to take several decades to gather the data and classify. It's going to take another several decades to actually analyze what happens with each little, uh, little part of the DNA and RNA. Gathering data is one word. Analyzing data is a, th- a second word. The third area of work is the implementation of a program of action based on the, the analysis of the data. To come up with a strategic course of action based on your analysis of the data. So these three things have to go on. And while they're going on, you will many times have emotional pressure to do something. You will many times have, uh, have what I call people pressure to do something. You remember Saul the king? And he made a sacrifice because Samuel was delayed for some reason. What was the pressure for Saul felt? Emotional pressure and people pressure. He saw the people running away. So why did they run away? God is the one who will do the battle. If he doesn't know the cause of action, don't act. And he acted and he lost his kingdom. Isn't it strange? He acted to preserve the kingdom and he acted and he lost his kingdom. From that day on, God says, I'm no more on your side. I will no more be with you. And he lost everything. He forgot one thing. God was the one who gave him his kingdom. Not the people. And he acted and he lost his kingdom. Isn't it strange? He acted to preserve the kingdom and he acted and he lost his kingdom. From that day on, God says, I'm no more on your side. I will no more be with you. And he lost everything. He forgot one thing. God was the one who gave him his kingdom. Not the people. So the third is coming now with a... An action, a program of action based on the analysis. Now all these three things have to be done with prayer. That's the slowness part. And in any mega church, you must be prepared to do those three things. The bigger you are, the higher your position, the more you must do those three things. You don't just simply react. Those things are for baby organization. Those things are for small micro organization. Because your mistakes will only affect two or three. But in a mega church, your mistake in decision making is going to affect the lives of thousands. You have to implement this discipline on the slow path. Then the discipline on the fast side. When you know the program action and you have come to a conclusion and the fullness of time, everything is set and you, and you know what to do, then you have to be as fast as lightning. Because when you act, the devil will start thinking and evaluating your action. And before the devil can react, you have finished your action. Remember Jesus? He was just waiting and waiting and waiting for three Nearly three years he revealed to his disciples. Then one day he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Say, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus revealed to them for the first time that he came as a suffering Messiah. And Satan started reacting, but Satan don't know how to react. He took Satan by surprise. Satan assumed that he's going to come and set up an early kingdom. And so Satan immediately used Peter. To stop him from going to the cross. Do you realize that? In Matthew 16. Jesus rebuked Satan. Satan? No. Asked Satan to get lost and, and took authority over Satan. Satan didn't know how to react. He used Peter to try to stop Jesus. But later on, Satan was thinking, reacting to the new revelation. Should he let Jesus go to the cross? Should he not let Jesus go to the cross? In the end, Satan made a decision. He will push Jesus to the cross and kill him. And he used Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus and send Jesus to the cross. And all the demons were rejoicing, thinking they had victory. But lo and behold, even that was included in God's plan. God outperformed, outtaught, outstrategized the devil. The book of 1 Corinthians tells us if if all the princes of the world knew what's going to happen, they wouldn't do what they do. What else happening? The moment God acted, Satan hardly had time to react. And all his reactions were wrong. 
At the moment you know a cause or program, you need to act fast because number one, you have an enemy. You do not wrestle with flesh and blood, you wrestle with demonic forces. And if the cause of your action is to bring the will of God on this earth as it is in heaven, you can expect that Satan is going to not, not going to let that go easily. Every action of yours and every program of yours that brings the will of God to be done on this earth will be satanically opposed. That's so why number one, you've got to act fast if you know what to act. You've got to act fast, quick and precise. Because number one, you have an enemy. Satanic opposition. Number two, human opposition. Because human beings, some will know the word, some will not know the word. Some can hear God, some cannot hear God. Some will be used by the enemy, but most of them will just use the human reasoning. They don't understand everything and uh, they don't have time to react. It will just be like a tidal wave when God works. You either flow with it or you're left behind. Number two is human reasoning and opposition. By the time they finish reasoning, you have already completed your job. They can only accept or reject it. Now in all these things, I'm not talking about lack of consultation or anything else. Those are in my earlier point. There's a balance between consultation and uh, etc. And being influenced by peer pressure. Those things are covered by earlier leadership principles on decision making. Remember, we have a whole list of things on decision making. But here we're talking about mega church principle. When a program is implemented, there's no more slowness. Which is why sometimes when uh, something is implemented, it cannot be slow. When the Holy Spirit began to move, for example, most of you notice that it, when we move by the Spirit and, and minister to the sick, etc., we may take time. We may take time to worship. We may take time to pray. We may take time to build up the presence of God. But once the presence of God comes, I move very fast. And if you don't flow along, you miss the healing. That's it. When the presence of God comes, you find that there's an urgency even away and move because you don't know how long that manifestation is going to stay. And I used to tell people, come quick, if God's doing this, do it now. God is willing this one now. Come now. Why? Because I know that the presence of God is there and if we don't tell on it quick, it will be just gone. See the harmony of the two? It takes time to build the presence of God. Once the presence of God comes, you must act quick before the manifestation goes. So number two, human reasoning. Sometimes, you know, when, when, when the Lord is moving and uh, the presence of God is there and you take too long, people will start reasoning in their mind, it affects faith. Fear starts coming. And human reason. Now, some is so satanic opposition, that's one thing. But the other is human reasoning and opposition. And the presence of God is moving, and all these things are come, and people are reacting slowly. Please come quickly. Come, oh come. Oh come, oh come. One more time. One more time. One more time. People start reasoning. The presence of God leaves. Too slow. We have to harmonize both. That's the second sub point there. On... Uh, why you have to act quick? Human opposition. Number three. Oh no. This side here. Besides satanic opposition, human reasoning, we have what we call, let me find the right phrase for it. We have, number three, a time limit for the solution of a problem. Problems that are not solved within a time limit since you have taken all the time to analyze, you have only less time. Do you realize that if you take more time for analysis, you got less time for the action? It's almost sometimes like playing a chess game. You know, when you play an international chess game, you have a time limit. You have to make, for example, 40 moves within how, how many minutes. You can take as, as, as much time as you want in your strategy. But if you have only 5 minutes to complete the next 20 moves, you've got to finish 20 moves within the 5 minutes. No matter how good your game is, if you don't complete in that time, you still lose. There is a time limit when the action would still be classified correct and right. A right action 
too slow becomes wrong. People who say, I do not want to accept Jesus yet, are making a decision not to accept now. There is a time coming when it may be too late to accept the Lord. When Jesus comes, there will be the sound of the trumpet like a twinkling of an eye. And you may say, I wait till the trumpet sound and I, quick, I will pray quickly. When the trumpet sound and I know that the church is going to be raptured, I'm going to pray quickly. Let you come to my heart and forgive me. I'm going to say, no, Lord, don't say it now. You say, I mean. The Bible says that it's only in the twinkling of an eye. Can you pray those prayers in the twinkling of the eye? Here you go. Your mouth will be open while everybody is raptured. <laughs> You're about to call Jesus. Ah! And we're gone. <laughs> There's a time when there's no more time. And it's important for us to realize why we have to be quick because we have taken all the time we need for the preparation. The same when, you know, a fruit tree takes time to grow. Durian trees, most of the time, they take about five years. But when the fruit tree grows, can you still take your time? When the, when the fruit is there and the fruit, durian fruit is falling, can you see, take your time? Never my last lonely la. I spent five years on this tree. After all, the fruit will always be there. I'm sorry, the fruit will not always be there. You have mooches and durian lovers who may hang around your durian tree. And you take your time, and as you take your time, you may find that the du- your durians have all disappeared. Somebody has picked them up. Or you may find the wild animals came and ate them. Some orang utan who loves it has taken your durian. Or number three, you find that your durian that has fallen and laid lying there for 10 days waiting for you to pick it up has rotted. And it's not good for eating anymore. Not even good enough to use for durian cake. Can't use it at all. There is a time span, shall I call it expiry date, when it's no more good. There is an expiry date for the solving of every problem. That's why sub point three is important. Let me look at the book of Acts. As we leave this point, Ooh, praise the Lord. <laughs> the book of Acts. Well, I think I just covered this point and we close. Uh, Book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 1 and to verse uh, 3. This is the church at Antioch. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetra, and Sons, the minister of the Lord, and Pastor, the Holy Spirit, said, Now separate to me, Barnabas, and so for the work which I have called them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you know that it took them some years to stay together, to pray together. Acts chapter 11, Saul went there and they were teaching in the church of Antioch for over a year or two. And here as they were praying and just spending time with God, suddenly it came time to launch for the missionary journey. And in verse 4, he commanded them to be... Uh, where, where am I? Ah, verse, uh, verse 3, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. There was no more delay. When the Holy Spirit said, Now they sent them. But what were they doing before? They were, they were taking time. They were taking time to prepare, to worship God, building their own life, building their ministry, building their character. But when it came time to go, they must not delay. Any delay after Acts 13 verse 2 is a disobedience to the Holy, disobedience to the Holy Spirit. And they went. Thank God they obey God and went. Look at Acts chapter 15, a different problem. Verse 1, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, this problem had already occurred a bit here and there, a bit here and there. It has occurred in Acts chapter 11. It came to the point when there were a lot of Gentiles who were converted. In Acts 11, do you know they never solved the problem of the Gentile, of the Gentile question? They never solved the problem of the Judaizers who were very against the Gentiles coming to know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. They wanted the Gentiles to be, 
to be like the Jews. And when, when Peter was sent to Cornelius, there was these Judaizers who were so angry and upset at him for going to the Gentiles. They questioned him in Acts chapter 11, why do you go to the Gentiles? Now they could be accepted if there's only a small little group of, of, of Gentiles. But now it's going to affect thousands of Gentiles and all the churches that the Apostle Paul had established all were primarily Gentile churches. And if this problem is not solved here at the base church in Antioch, it's going to affect Paul's work and ministry. And when they don't know the solution, they leave it. But when they know the solution, they will do something about it. It tells us that they sent Paul and Barnabas straight to Jerusalem without delay. And in Jerusalem, there was a great debate and argument. But finally, when they implemented a plan of action, there was no more backtracking. Anyone who went against Acts 15 became a heretic, a Judaizer, worthy of condemnation or excommunication from the church. Do you realize that? Once the plan of action was done, it separates the extreme from the right. And Paul in the book of Galatians called this group of people dogs. Now he could do that because now they have a program of action. And in Acts 15, verse 30, when they have written letters as to what cause of action to take after a great debate, in verse 30, Acts 15, so when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they are ready, they rejoice over his encouragement. Do you know that was the end of the Judaizers? In Acts 15, verse 1 and 2, they were claiming authority from Jerusalem. So Paul said, all right, you claim authority from Jerusalem, let me check with Jerusalem. And they went and checked, they found that Jerusalem hasn't settled the question. And so they argued, they debated, they had no small dissension. Finally, they came to agreement, a program of action, and it was settled. Very quick, within one chapter, it was settled. But do you know the actual problem went on? Because those group of people don't give up. In the book of Galatians, the people were still troubling the Gentiles. Paul called them dogs, unjing. That's the only time in the Bible where you, say, you can find a phrase called, Beware of dogs. Calls them unjing. And he dares to call them that because they have already started the question. And you know, Paul... When Peter himself came in Galatians and he went against all the things that was right, Paul stood up. And it's because Paul was willing to stand against peer pressure, against Judaistic pressure, he made an impact on his society. Because of him, we Gentiles have the gospel as we have it today. Oh, if Paul didn't stand up, every single one of you men right here will be circumcised. And you ladies don't laugh. Because all you ladies will probably be wearing veils to church. And every one of us will be keeping Jewish customs. I'll have to be wearing a little hat while I preach. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. He made a decision that was right. And he stick by it. So the Program of action implementation must be fast and quick. Now the study, you must give all the time you should. And then we balance the harmony of slow and fast. And it takes discipline for both sides. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we ask that you continue to build our lives upon your word. Lord, as we grow in you, we thank you, Lord. And as each one of us grow in our businesses, grow in our ministry. We begin to realize, Lord, that the principles we held to when we were small are no more applicable when we are big. And the things, Lord, that we have, we, the way we do things and the way we react that was acceptable when we were small are no more acceptable when we grow inside. Whether in our ministry or in our organization or in our business. Oh, Father God, give us wisdom. Because you said that the church shall be the head and not the tail. Lord, in the world, the worldly people and the carnal people and satanic people are building big organizations. They are thinking big, oh God, in order to conquer this earth for Satan. Oh Father, I pray that you raise up people in our midst, you raise up the body of Christ that we will think big. That we will, we will believe in bigness because we have a big God. 
And greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And Father God, that you inspire in each one of us the understanding, the principles, how to run a big organization, a big ministry, a big business for you to your glory, so that we could reach this world for Jesus. So that we would have the impact, the influence, and the power of saying something that will influence millions of people. Oh, Father God, help us to understand the responsibility of that power too. And help us to remain humble, oh God, even as the privileges and the responsibility increase. So that we continue to give you all the glory. We continue to find our place in you, knowing that without Jesus we can do nothing. But yet with Jesus we can do everything. And we can win this world for Jesus. Lord, thank you. We give you praise, glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together. Lift your vision high. Thank you, Jesus. Live your vision high In a way that you never had before Live your vision higher And you will see the glory of the Lord For without the progressive vision you will dwell carelessly without a progressive vision you will dwell carelessly so live your vision higher and you will see the glory of the Lord praise God give Jesus a good clap of faith God bless you